Again, thank you for being here this morning. Um, open your Bibles, if you, if you will, to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Uh, we're continuing in our sermon series that is titled Proverbs, Walking Wisely in a Wicked World. And again, I've said this week to week, right? This starts with our justification. I have to, I have to be saved. I have to be born again. To walk wisely in this wicked world, I need a relationship with God the Father, through God the Son, by God the Spirit. Amen? And this continues, walking wisely in a wicked world continues in our sanctification. Our sanctification happens when we are growing in God's wisdom, in God's knowledge, in God's understanding. Amen? It's not my wisdom. It's not my understanding. It's not my intellect that needs to increase. I need to grow as a child of God in God's wisdom. Listen to this from 1 Kings chapter 3. It's on your screen, verse 28. I was reading this this week with our kiddos. But this is talking about King Solomon. After he asked God for wisdom to discern and rightly judge the people of God, the Israelites, he was faced with this very controversial issue. Two women claiming the same son. And his response to that was very graphic. His response to that was very candid, very bold. But what he was able to do, he was able to discern in that moment whose kid this little boy rightly belonged to. But this is something that I found so interesting that ties in with our sermon series. 1 Kings 3.28 says, All Israel heard about the judgment the king, King Solomon, had given. And they stood in awe of the king. Look at this. Because they saw that God's wisdom was in him to carry out justice. Amen? Again, we are growing in God's wisdom. Walking wisely in a wicked world, being sanctified. Right? Allowing the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me into all truth as I diligently study who God is and how he wants me to live, I grow in his wisdom, not mine. This morning, we're going to look at another aspect of walking wisely in a wicked world. We're going to focus in on friendship. We're going to have so much fun doing this, friendship. And I was preparing this. um, I just got to gauge the room, though. Does anybody know the song Friends from Michael W. Smith, 1982? I got a couple here. Yeah, some, some 1982. It was released in 1983, Friends. Remember that song? Um, friends are friends forever if the Lord's the Lord of them. And a friend will not say never if the welcome will not end. Cause the, or a friend will not say, yeah, because the welcome will not end. Though it's hard to let you go. In the Father's hands, we know that a lifetime's not too long to live as friends. Isn't that wonderful? They played that at my 1999 graduation. And all these kids in this Christian school are crying. They're playing this song. They're crying. We're going to be friends forever, and we're never going to lose touch. That's not, that's not true. So there's seasons. Seasons happen. I'm still friends with many of the Uh, 1999 graduates from Altamont Christian School, but I'm not in a friendship with them. That relationship is different. I'm in a different season of life. And because of distance, I grew up in Florida, and everybody is down there. Being in a consistent relationship or a friendship with them is really difficult to pull off. So this morning, I want to preach to you a a message that is titled, Friendship God's Way. And I want, to, I want to define that for you. Friendship God's Way can be defined as the intentional companionship between two people doing life together for the purpose of growing in God's grace, mercy, and love. Think about that. Two people who are intentionally, intentionally doing life together. There's an intentionality in their companionship. And they, doing life together, have the purpose or are seeking after or pushing towards the purpose of growing in God's grace, mercy, and love. 
We can all say that we have many friends, but not many friendships, right? Many friends, but not many friendships. And, and this is most commonly pointed out with today's social media world, right? We have a lot of friends on our social media accounts, but not a lot of friendships or relationships, intentional companionships in that world. Some are designed with a greater capacity for friendships than others, meaning there are some who are able to maintain more friendships with people than others are able to maintain. Me personally, I have many friends, but only a few friendships. And I'm not trying to be cliche. I'm not trying to be cute either because my wife is here. But my wife is truly my best friend. Amen? We enjoy a friendship that is an intentional companionship. We are doing life together. We have purposed in our relationship to grow together in God's grace, mercy, and love. If you and I are paying attention, God has placed all of us in different relationships with different people, supernaturally and strategically. Amen? I can be in a friendship, by the way, with an unbeliever. But I must see that relationship as God's way of introducing himself to that person. That's evangelism. And that's how I encourage that individual to grow in the grace, mercy, and love of God. How do I encourage an unsaved friend to grow in the grace, mercy, and love of God? I encourage them evangelistically to get saved. Call on the name of Jesus, right? Call on his name for forgiveness of sins, for salvation. That's how I help my unsaved friend that God has supernaturally and strategically placed me in relationship with to grow in the grace, mercy, and love of God. Get saved. Some friendships, let me make this statement, are seasonal, while others have endured through different chapters of life, right? We can all say that. Looking back on our lives, some friends have endured through different chapters of our lives and some relationships, friendships, intentional companionships that we have are simply seasonal. God intends for us to be in relationship with other people in this life. Do we agree with that? God has designed us and created us for the purpose of being in relationship with others. Proverbs 18.1 says this, it's on your screen, one who isolates himself pursues selfish desires. He rebels against all sound wisdom. If your goal and pursuit in this life is to be alone in isolation, that's not what God desires. There may be seasons or moments in life when you will need to get alone for God's purpose, but to live in isolation away from people and away from God is a selfish pursuit. That's what the text says. That lifestyle is all about self. God wants to be in relationship with us. Amen? And he wants us to be in relationship with others. Now let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I want to frame our study, Friendship God's Way. I want to frame it with this text right here, Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 12. We're going to frame it with this text. We're going to ask a challenge question from this text, and then we're going to go to the book of Proverbs, and we're going to rip through the book of Proverbs really to look at how we are going to live this out in our lives, walking wisely in a wicked world. But look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. Amen? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. If you're alone and doing life alone, the reward for your effort is enjoyed in isolation. There is no enjoyment. There is no reward in that in intentional companionship. That's why... Two are better than one. Very simple. Verse number 10, four, if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person alone keep warm? Any military vets here? 
you know exactly what this is talking about. This is talking about spooning, right? I was in a very cold situation one night guarding a, a piece of property with a military uh, brother of mine, and he and I were left there alone at night with no gear. His name is Dal Rimple. His last name, Private Dal Rimple. He's a rad guy. He's a big fella. So I had a great spooning partner that evening. We kept warm together. Because we were together, we could do that. <laughs> Verse 12, and if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. I love that statement, that sentence. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. I've seen many sermons come out of this one, one sentence, right? I've seen many statements come out of this one, one sentence, right? If a man marries a woman and they involve the Holy Spirit in their holy matrimony, there's a three-corded strand or a three-stranded cord that can't be broken. I've heard that. Here's what I want to tell you. A single-stranded cord is weak. A two-stranded cord, a little bit stronger. A three-stranded cord, when you begin to braid those three strands together, that cord is difficult to break. The text is telling us life is better, doing life is better when you do it with other people in relationship with them. Amen? That's what this text is telling us. So when we understand doing friendship or friendship God's way, we understand Friendship God's way means I am an intentional companionship in intentional companionship with other people in my life for the purpose of growing in God's grace, mercy, and love. Here's my question for us today. Thinking about intentional companionships that we are in, right? God has supernaturally and strategically put each and every one of us in different relational circles, Here's my question. Are you the kind of friend that God wants you to be? That's tough, right? Right away, there's conviction just in that sentence. When we begin to examine God's word and begin to examine the kind of friend that he wants us to be, we begin to examine or evaluate our lives next to scripture and we say, man, I fall short in many ways. We're going to look at a good friend, or better yet, a godly friend this morning. We'll define that kind of friend according to Scripture so that we can do friendship God's way. And here's where we're going. I want to start by examining, first and foremost, I want to start by examining what God has done to be in relationship with us and how Jesus exemplified being the ultimate friend, right? This helps me walk wisely in a wicked world when I understand who he is and what he's done to be in relationship with us. Because it also helps me understand how he wants me to live. I want to look at several verses in the book of Proverbs this morning that will help us understand what a good, or again, a godly friend is. And we're also going to see this morning the purpose of doing friendship God's way. Again, are you the kind of friend that God wants you to be? Amen? Let's jump into uh, the Word of God, and we'll begin to examine this. But I want to stop and just pray for a second, just to ask God to bless our time as we begin to reflect on this topic. God, thank you for this. And we are all openly and honestly asking, are we the kind of friend that you want us to be in? The relationships, God, that you have put us in. You have put us supernaturally and strategically in different relationships. Are we the kind of friend that you want us to be in those relationships? And God, where do we need correcting? And first and foremost, we want to focus in on and glorify and really just show our gratitude to you for what you have done to be in relationship with us. Love consists in this, not that we loved you, but God, you loved us. You sent your son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus, you came and you put on flesh. You humbled yourself. And you were obedient to the point of death on a cross so that we can be in relationship with you. We thank you for that. We thank you for your sacrifice. 
Help us as we examine this in Scripture and learn, God, and grow in your wisdom. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to make a statement to start out. I can be in friendship with God because of what Jesus has done. Amen? I can be in friendship with God because of what Jesus has done. Let's start there this morning. Turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Don't worry, we're going to get to Proverbs. John chapter 15. I want to frame this, though, again, jumping out of Ecclesiastes, really examining friendship God's way. But I want to start by looking at what God has done to be in relationship with all of us. John 15, verse number 9, it says this, As the Father has loved me, Jesus says, remember he's talking to his disciples. They've just celebrated that last Passover meal together, that last supper meal together. Judas has gone out. He's going to do what he is going to do, which is betray our Savior. This is prophetically spoken, spoken of. He is going to do that. But here Jesus is talking to the remaining disciples as they're getting ready to go out and walk across the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives where Jesus is going to have this most amazing time in prayer before he lays his life down for you and for me and for the sins of the whole world. But look what he says here. John 15, verse number 9, As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, plural, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. And then he says this, verse 13, No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. Right? Jesus is the only one that could accomplish this statement. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. The laying down of his life for his friends means we can have eternal life through him. Because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Nobody comes to the Father, nobody enters into relationship, that friendship with the Father, except through the Son and by the Spirit. Amen? I've seen this verse used so many times for heroes of the military or heroes of law enforcement or the first responder community. Nobody has greater love than this than to lay down his life for a friend. And I agree with that statement. But Jesus is the only one who could lay his life down for you and for me and for the sins of this world. Eternal life could not be accomplished through anyone else. Why? Because Jesus is the Messiah. Amen? He is the Son of God, the Son of Man, fully God, fully man. Amen? That's exciting. Verse 14, he says, you are my friends. If... You do what I command you. Do you see that? Jesus wants to be in relationship. Jesus wants to be in a friendship with you and with me. This, we know, this statement, this, this time that he's having with his disciples extends to us. Why? In John 17, when he prays, he says, I'm not praying just for these guys. He says, I'm praying also for those who believe in me through their word. So we know Jesus wants to be our friend. He wants us to be in a friendship with him. And he accomplished that. He made that possible by laying his life down for us. Amen? Turn over to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse number 11 says, So then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, verse 12, you were without Christ, 
excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who made both groups one, and he tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. Look at verse 16. This is why he did this. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. Amen? Jesus Christ gave his life. He laid his life down. Why? So that we as humanity... Jew and Gentile, all of those outside of that nationality, everybody can be in relationship with God the Father, through God the Son, by God the Spirit, because of who Jesus is and what he accomplished. He accomplished what he accomplished by laying his life down on the cross. He went to a grave and he was raised to life again so that he could reconcile all to God in one body. And he did this through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. Do you see that? The hostility, that dividing wall of hostility is between or was between humanity and God. And Jesus accomplished tearing that down by laying his life down on a cross so that we can be reconciled to God, so that we can be in relationship with him in a friendship, that intentional companionship. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. I know there's a lot of text this morning or a lot of scripture, but you'll be okay. It's fine. It's good. 2 Corinthians 5. Now we understand who Christ is and what he's accomplished because he calls us friends, right? We are his friends, possessive tense, when we enter into relationship with him. When we recognize who he is and accept what he accomplished on the cross in the grave and raised to life again. And we call on his name for forgiveness of sins, for salvation. We enter into relationship, into friendship with him. And we understand he did this, he accomplished this by laying down his life. He tore down that dividing wall of hostility. He reconciled us to God by laying his life down on that cross. Amen? And here we have a role to play in this, in the relationships where God has placed us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 16. From now on, then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he has given us, look at this, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling who? the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. What do we plead? Be reconciled to God. God's put us in relationship with people so that we can tell them, hey, you need to be reconciled to God. How? Through Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You need to call on his name to be saved. You need to be reconciled. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Notice this. God did not save us and remove us from this planet. Everybody with me? We're still here. Why? Because he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We are God's evangelism plan for this planet. 
We tell people to enter into friendship and intentional companionship with our God, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by calling on the name of his son, our Savior Jesus, who is fully God and fully man, who laid his life down for us, who died for your sins and my sins, and not just for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Amen? That is our job. So we need to see when we begin to study this, this topic of friendship God's way, I can be in friendship with God because of what Jesus has done. And because of what he's done in my life, I can go tell other people, be in relationship. Be reconciled to God. He's done the reconciling work. Here's the next statement I want to make this morning. And we'll finish out. This morning in the book of Proverbs, if you want to head that way in your Bibles. But here's the statement I want to make. I can be the friend that God wants to that God wants me to be in the friendships he has given to me. I can be the friend that God wants me to be in the friendships, the relationships that he has supernaturally and strategically put me in. Here's a side note real quick. Before we look at a good friend or a godly friend and the qualities that God's word tells us fill, inform, consume a godly friend, before we get to that, here's a quick side note. What is a bad friend? A bad friend is not trustworthy, is not loyal, will gossip, and repeat something you shared in confidence. A bad friend will stir up conflict and be obstinate. A bad friend will use you, is envious, and instead of forgiving, will hold a grudge. We have read through many of these Proverbs that deal with this type of individual. And that really defines what a bad friend is. And I would venture to say that is no friend at all. Amen? Amen. But let's look, in the remaining time we have together, let's look at being the friend God wants us to be so that we can really examine and answer this challenge question. Are you the kind of friend God wants you to be? Let's look at it. Proverbs 3, verse 27. Proverbs 3, verses 27 through 28. I want you to look at this statement. A good friend answers the phone. I love this one. A good friend answers the phone. Not during church. (laughs) Proverbs 3, verses 27 through 28. Look at this. When it is in your power, don't withhold good from the one to whom it belongs. Don't say to your neighbor, go away, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow when it is there with you, right? When it is in your power, in your capacity, in your ability to act and to do, you need to pick up the phone and answer it. A good friend will answer the phone, right? Your friends, those people God has put you in friendships with, intentional companionships to do life together for the purpose of growing in God's grace, mercy, and love, will at times call you and say, bro, sis, I need help. And a good friend answers the phone, right? A good friend will say, hey, if it's within my means, if it's within my ability, if it's within my capacity to do this, I will do this for you. I will help you, right? We've all seen that. A good friend will give you the shirt off of his or her back, right? That statement has has been long-lasting. That's what a good friend will do. And I'll tell you this, a Christian friend will answer the phone. A Christian friend will sacrifice time. A Christian friend will, will consider others as more important, will put their interest above their own, will answer the phone and say, how can I help? That's a difficult one, amen? Proverbs 11, verse number 13. We'll make several statements like this. Proverbs 11, verse 13. A good friend can be trusted. A good friend can be trusted. A gossip goes around revealing a secret. 
but a trustworthy person keeps a confidence, right? A trustworthy person will keep that thing, that statement, that incident, those details confident. They will keep them in confidence. They're not going to repeat the matter. They're not going to go around and tell everybody what was just said. There are so many people, even in uh, Christianity, and I say that, folks, knowing I've grown up in church. I've seen a lot of different people in a lot of different capacities. And I will say there are Christians that I've interacted with and experienced life with who do nothing but receive information from one person and they're just excited as they receive it because they can't wait to go out and tell somebody else. It's like they're the first ones with the info and they want to go repeat the matter to everyone else. That is destructive, folks, and that friend is not trustworthy. Amen? Proverbs 13 Verse number 20, a good friend will share God's wisdom. A good friend will share God's wisdom. Proverbs 13, verse number 20. The one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. I love that statement, a good friend will share God's wisdom, right? I want to grow in the wisdom of God so that I can be the kind of friend to you in our friendship, in our intentional companionship, so that I can share God's wisdom with you. How many friends, they come to you and they say, I've, I've got to tell you this, I'm going through this, here's the situation. And oftentimes, instead of sharing the wisdom of God with them, we give them our own opinion, our own advice, our own counsel. Instead of saying, okay, let's pray. Let's see what God has to say about this. Amen? A good friend, walking with wise, will become wise. A good friend will be that growing in, in God's wisdom person so that they can share God's wisdom. That takes work, by the way, to grow in God's wisdom. What does that mean? I need to intentionally invest time in God's word so that I can grow in God's wisdom so that when my friend who I'm in a friendship and in that intentional companionship comes to me and says, bro, I need help, I could say, here's what God's wisdom says, not mine. Let me get out of the way. Let me point you to what God's word says. Proverbs 15, verse number one, a good friend answers gently. A good friend answers gently. Proverbs 15, verse number 1. I love this. A gentle answer turns away anger, but a harsh word stirs up wrath, right? Those people that love conflict, they love to be obstinate. They love to stir up that conflict in relationships, so they will answer harshly. But a good friend answers gently. That gentle answer turns away anger. Here's a quick side note so that you can get this. This Proverbs, Proverbs 15, verse number 1, is two-sided. I can be a good friend and give a gentle answer to my friend who's getting upset and irritated and angry and hostile and worked up over a situation. I can be a good friend and provide a gentle answer. But I can also do this in my own life. When I get angry, when I get worked up, when I get consumed by something, and so, of course, righteously indignant, I can give myself, I can speak a soft answer myself and begin to calm myself down. Everybody with me on that? So this is two-sided. A good friend will answer gently, though. That, that friend that loves conflict will just introduce harshness. The next statement here, a good friend forgives quietly. Proverbs 17, verse 9. A good friend forgives quietly. Proverbs 17, verse 9. Whoever conceals an offense promotes love. But whoever gossips about it separates friends. Right? Whoever conceals an offense promotes love. That is that quiet ability to be Christ-like in our relationships. To say, okay, you've offended me. You've done something wrong. But I'm going to promote love by forgiving you and keeping this matter quiet. 
and I'm going to move on with life. And that's what a good friend will do. The next statement here, a good friend doesn't start fights. Look at verse 14 of Proverbs 17. A good friend doesn't start fights. Verse 14, to start a conflict is to release a flood. Stop the dispute before it breaks out, right? Folks, just because I'm saying a good friend, you know, conceals things and, and, and promotes love by forgiving quietly doesn't mean there is no confrontation in our lives. There are times good friends need to talk and work things out. But if you want to just conflict, if you want to just fight, this is a, a, a releasing of a flood. It's going to have a lot of consequences. But a good friend here doesn't start fights. They stop the dispute before it breaks out. How? Going back to Proverbs 15.1. Answer gently. Share the wisdom of God. I begin to do these things in my relationship, and God is able to work in and through. Amen? Uh, Proverbs 27, verse 6. A good friend can be trusted to tell the truth. Proverbs 27, Verse number six, I love this when it says the wounds of a friend are trustworthy, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive, right? We talked about confrontation. There are times when we need to get real with each other and talk. Hey, there's been an issue. There's been an offense. There's been tension in our relationship. We just need to have a conversation. And the wounds of a friend are trustworthy, that means your willingness in that relationship to be honest. I need to do this gently, right? There needs to be that gentle answer. But I do need to be honest. A faithful friend, a trustworthy friend will tell you the truth. Like, bro, you're the one with the issue. Sometimes that's hard to hear. But a faithful friend, those wounds that are faithful, that we can, that we can count on, are trustworthy because... Truth is being proclaimed. The kisses of an enemy, though, are excessive. Go back to Proverbs 17. A good friend is loyal. I got a couple of more and then we're done. Proverbs 17, verse number 17. A good friend is loyal. Verse number 17 says, A friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for a difficult time. Amen? A good friend, a friend loves at all times, right? That is, as much as we can, humanly speaking, that is expressing unconditional love. That is actually impossible for humans to do, but when we allow God to work in us and through us, we can love at all times. That is in the good times and the bad times, right? This is, this is where those wedding vows come in. A friend will love at all times. A brother is born for difficult times. That companionship, that familial relationship is there, created by God for difficult times so we don't have to endure life alone. Proverbs 18, verse 24, a good friend is closer than family. So think about this. Because we just read, a brother is born for a difficult time. But Proverbs 18.24 says, One with many friends may be harmed, but there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. What does that verse mean? There is a friend who stays closer than a brother. In fact, let me say this to all the kids in the room, especially the siblings, this can be accomplished in that brother or sister relationship. But a friend here staying closer than that means it is not just a family or a blood relationship. I'm not just in an, an, uh, an acquaintance type relationship with you because I was born into your family. Just because I'm your brother or sister doesn't mean I'm going to be a close friend. There are brothers and sisters who are not very close. A good friend, though, a Christian, godly, 
filled with the wisdom of God, friend, will be closer than that brother, will stay in relationship, that intentional companionship through thick and thin, amen? Through the highs and lows, through the good times and the bad times. So this supersedes or goes beyond just being family. But this can be accomplished in family. I've seen brothers and sisters who are best friends. Amazing, right? I got four kiddos. We're seeing that, that relationship being, you know, grown between them. A lot of fights, but there's some good stuff there. But this can be accomplished in those relationships, but those good friends will be closer, right? Proverbs 19.11 a good friend is insightful. I like this statement. A good friend is insightful. Proverbs 19.11, a person's insight gives him patience. Right? I love that statement. A person's insight gives him patience. What is patience? Really, it's being able to wait. How do I wait patiently? How do I understand the patience of God? I need to have insight Sometimes, friends, sometimes we don't have all the answers, but I can still wait patiently because of my insight. So this helps. Let me, let me give you this trick when I'm sitting in traffic. This really helps. I can begin to inform my thoughts with insight. What is the reason for this congestion? Well, it could be a traffic collision. That's a bad day for somebody. Am I willing to wait for their bad day? Am I willing to wait patiently as they are enduring something so difficult in their lives in that moment? Right? That makes you think differently. Patience is produced in your life when you inform yourself insightfully. But look what it says, verse 11, and his virtue is to overlook an offense. Why is that tied in with patience? That insightful presentation and manifestation in my life of patience. Because I am offended quite often. In fact, I am the offender quite often in relationship. I do things that offend. But what we can do as a godly friend is we can begin to inform ourselves with insight what is going on in that person's life? I don't know what they're going through. I don't know why they said what they just said to offend me. Husbands with wives, wives with husbands, this is something so wonderful. I don't know what is going through their mind right now to get us to this difficult place of tension and conflict, but I need to begin to inform myself insightfully so that I can be a patient person and can overlook this virtue of overlooking an offense. This does not mean that you will never be offended. It does mean because of your insight, and because of your understanding of that situation, you'll be, over, you'll be able to overlook it. That's an amazing godly friend. I can overlook this and continue in relationship Closer than a brother, closer than a sister. Enduring through thick and thin, through highs and lows, through good times and bad times. Because I am insightfully informing myself. I'm producing patience in my life. And I'm able to overlook that offense. Isn't that wonderful? How God has designed things. A good friend is ready to listen. Proverbs 27 verse 9. Proverbs 27, verse 9. Oil and incense bring joy to the heart, and the sweetness of a friend is better than self-counsel. Right? It's better to have somebody to talk to. A good friend is ready to listen. That's sometimes the best advice you can give, is simply listening. Closing this and opening this. That's it. Proverbs 27, 17, the last one here. I want to end on this one. A good friend strengthens others. This is a well-known verse. Iron sharpens iron, and one person sharpens another. And this is really the most wonderful consequence of being in good godly friendships. 
Think about an intentional companionship with another person in this life for the purpose of growing in God's grace, mercy, and love. We begin to sharpen each other, strengthen each other in our relationships. That's what a good friend, a godly friend does. A bad friend will bring you down. A bad, bad friend will turn you away from God's wisdom, advice, and counsel. A good friend, a godly friend will sharpen you, will strengthen you. Why? Going back to sharing God's wisdom, loving through many difficult times, staying closer than a brother, being insightful in my relationship. That iron sharpening iron happens in relationship when we both do things God's way. And we grow in God's grace, mercy, and love in our intentional companionship because we are doing friendship God's way. You see how it all ties in together? It's so wonderful. This will improve our relationships. This will improve. Why? Because it's God's word. It's his way. It's his will. It's his purpose for us. I'm getting excited. Are you the kind of friend God wants you to be? As you think about this, as you think about everything we've talked through, are you the kind of friend God wants you to be? This is where we need to self-evaluate. Am I that gossip? Am I that friend who doesn't, I see that phone, oh, this is going to mean I'm going to have to sacrifice my time. I'm not going to answer it. I'm not going to patiently wait and overlook. I'm not going to have a virtue of overlooking an offense because I'm going to be ready to be offended. Why? Because it's all about me. Insight, again, when I have insight and understanding in a situation, it helps me get out of myself and look other places. That's what it really does. That's how we live patiently in this world. Are you the kind of friend God wants you to be? God, thank you for this. God, we thank you for this challenge. And we do stop again and we say thank you for planning ordaining, predestining salvation for us, making a way for us to be in relationship with you. God, you've accomplished so much. The command, Jesus, that the Father gave for you to speak and to proclaim was eternal life. And you called for everyone who would listen, everyone who would receive you, everyone who would accept you as Messiah, you called for all of us to believe in you. Because you want to be our friend. We praise you for that. We worship you for that. We thank you for that. Jesus, would you help us now to evaluate our own lives so that we can go out and be the kind of friend that you want us to be in the relationships that you've put us in. And when we really begin to examine those relationships, we see that you've put us in those relationships supernaturally and strategically for a reason, for a plan, for a purpose that you have, all to bring you glory. So God, help us to see these relationships, our, our friendships in that way, intentionally. And God, help us to go to your word, to begin to be informed by your word, so that we can be the kind of friend that you want us to be in these relationships. We love you. We praise you. We thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.